And Lori, can you hear me? Don't say anything you shouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> nope, but I can hear you fine, so. <laughs> I'll be careful too. Well, I got a notice and it just went live on um, YouTube. Your face is really lit up. Can you make it a little darker or put some makeup on? Makeup artist is taking a nap. <laughs> no, it's about the same. Oh, no, that's good. That's good. So the camera goes in and out. Yeah. I, I don't know where the other two are. They're not in my attendees yet. We've got five minutes. Yeah. Usually, usually you guys are on there a little earlier. It just makes me nervous. <laughs> well, of course. Just need one more for a quorum. <sighs> yeah, I'm not happy with the camera on this computer. I'm sure there's a way of tuning it, but I have to figure that out. Nor have I figured out a way of putting a background on. Mm -hmm. My technical staff does that stuff for me. <laughs> Can I rent them? <laughs> Steve? Probably, yeah. He'll come over for free. Well, he drinks wine or beer, doesn't he? Yeah. That would do it. I like my background, but I think it would be fun to have like the Tetons or Hawaii or something back there. I've got a great picture. Of Hi, folks. I can't, if you can hear me, I can't hear you. We hear you, Tom. Yep, we can hear you. Can't you hear, Tom? I'll have to learn sign language. Well, the old whiteboard, right? Right enough. I gotta figure out how to keep the glare off my glasses. You know, I'm looking at the agenda and I'm I'm actually kind of wondering if uh, Stuart has to recuse himself from several. He, I talked to him earlier. He said he was going to do that, but okay. he didn't say anything about not joining us. Okay. Did we lose Tom? I still see him. I don't know if he can hear us. Yeah, I could definitely see Stuart, you know, waiting until tree removal. Oh, there he's coming. There he is. Okay, I see some Tom. I see Stuart. Not all of you at once. I got to adjust my. There we go. My sound, can you guys hear me okay? Now we can, but you're too loud. Well, maybe I'll turn myself down. <laughs> Would I speak more softly? Um, there's, there's something about this particular Zoom application that, that my regular sound system doesn't seem to work with. Huh. huh. Do you, and we can, we can chat about it afterwards, but maybe if I send you a link through, uh, through a different email, would that help? 
I don't know. Please stand by. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Are you okay now, Tom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll chat after. Maybe there's a different way to get, because they do do a lot of Zooms. Stuart, you're on. You're hearing us. I'm hearing you. Are you hearing me? I am. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, we're all here. It's the Nevada City Planning Commission monthly meeting for the month of March. Uh, Amy, would you call the roll call, please? Yep. Chair Van Zant. Here. Commissioner Overholzer. Here. Commissioner Nye. Here. Commissioner Ladders. Here. And we have one vacancy, so we are all present. Uh, and thank you. Uh, the first item is going to be, well, actually, we have two items. We have the approval of the action minutes for January 21st and February 18th. We can take them together unless somebody wants to make a comment on one or the other. The January 21st was the one I had a problem with, and I haven't had time to go back and listen to the video on that one. So if we could hold that another meeting. Okay, so Amy, we're gonna pull number one. Okay. Okay, up to February 18th, going once. I have a okay. question. I have a question on this one. Okay. Um, the, the item, uh, oh. the public hearing item 11, on Wyoming Street, um, Amy was. Did the motion include? Remember, staff was asking that it be. Main thing was that staff was asking it to be uh, continued because you wanted the um, uh, building oh. envelope relative to steep slopes to be delineated. Yeah, part of the motion, or I don't think it made it in part of the motion, but it it seems you know I, I think I indicated that directly in the staff report. So I, it's probably probably a good idea to put it in there. So I can add just some verbiage that says, um, yeah, that staff has is has recommended continuance or something. Okay, if you could just add that sentence, then I'm fine with it. Okay. Okay, with that addition, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. A second. Okay, and thank you. All in favor, we'll just do a roll call. Or not a roll call, we can just do a verbal. Aye. 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 Okay, we've got it all. Amy, you got that? Got it. All right, thank you. Um, now we're coming up on the item number three, 319 Broad Street. Um, Stuart, I think you indicated that you were going to recuse yourself on this one. Yeah, I'm going to have to recuse myself because of proximity. So I will, ex I will uh, exit the meeting and be back for the next item. All right. And thank you for that. Um, all right, Amy. No, I'm going to no. bring our applicant here. So hold on just one second. I think, I think that's going through. Let's see. Okay, he's coming in. I'll I'll go ahead and start my my staff report here. Um, so the business owner John Wiberly is proposing a hanging sign for an existing business at three one nine Broad Street to hang from an existing bracket above the business entrance. The sign material will be medium density overlay plywood. <laughs> It will feature a two-sided um, sign and dimensions are, the total for both sides will be square, 12 square feet. It has a, a graphic uh, background painting of a woman with a, with a necklace. I wasn't sure how else to describe that one. Uh, the font is uh, what the applicant is describing as classic antique block lettering. Um, there's no border. Um, and the colors are, there's a, in your staff report, he's listed all the colors uh, from the Benjamin Moore Historical District or Historical Palette, um, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like seven pages of, of different um, colors that he's, he's indicated are in use. So with that, um, that is all I have. 
Okay. Uh, is the applicant on? Is that Russell? Jo uh, John Wiberly. John, can you hear us? He's got the muted symbol on. Yeah. John, I'm going to ask him to unmute. Okay, there you go. There you go. Hi. Hi. All right. Hey, John. Um, Amy just introduced the application, and traditionally we have the applicant uh, say something if they want to say something before we have our discussion. Uh, yeah, I actually have a sign that I applied for 16 years ago in my store now that was accepted. Uh, I'm doing a whole different thing here, mostly art. Uh, the image that I've submitted is from the 1880s. It's a personal piece that I own. And uh, yeah, any, any other questions on it? Um, anybody have a question of uh, John? Um, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you uh, if you're planning on including a <clears throat> some sort of frame detail on this. Not unless it's uh, required. I'm not. I wouldn't. I'm not suggesting it as a condition for uh, for uh, approval. I was just curious, and and uh, I'd also like to comment that it seems like for um for a, a business of this type, the sign of this type would be a creative and time appropriate. Uh, thing you could see a painting hanging uh, on the original or the early street of uh, Broad Street uh, in Nevada City. Yeah, so. my idea was that it was very inviting into my shop. Um, Thank you, Tom. Lori. Uh, well, uh, it, it certainly is inviting and it's pretty. I like the uh, type style. Um, I agree with Tom. Well, I don't know if Tom was saying he needed it or not, but I do think that the um, that it would uh, benefit from uh, and not look as modern with a uh, uh, a molding um, kind of frame around it on both sides. I do think that it's it's very different from the kinds of signs we normally approve, and of course the overriding. Um, Guideline is that we uh, that it be mother load in style, and to me it doesn't quite make that <coughs> that cut um, uh, when you look at the other kinds of of uh, very sort of more simple signs that we've approved, and um, so I, I I'd kind of like to urge you to do something that is, you know, more more simple with just the lettering, or um, or had something on it that depicted an antique more obviously than uh, a painting. I, I do think it looks pretty, pretty, pretty modern just because of the size of the graphic um, compared to other graphics that we have on <coughs> um, Science Downtown. So that's where I'm at on it. Um, I did a drive through the um broad this morning just to uh, refresh my memory. Uh, we don't have any signs that have pictures or paintings on them. We have no, we have a lot of different styles. We have frames, no frames. We have uh, some are very antique, but you know generally our baseline is the name of the business and what and the service, which uh, is covered very nicely uh, with the lettering. But there, this would be the first painting or picture downtown. Uh, we have some little art flourishes on a couple of the signs. So um, I'm agreeing, um, I think, with Lori on this one. I, I, you know, sign in the window, of, would, that's acceptable. Uh, but a, a sign out on the street. Generally, we like to keep the, you know, the, the more classic um, mother load. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that uh, that uh, John come back with another uh, another um, drawing and, and lose the uh, the painting for for this location right. for this business for. for this Peter? Peter, could I have just a little something? 
course. As long as you'll be coming back, it looks like um, it would be great if you could come back with your indirect lighting proposal also. That's actually supposed to be part of the application if you are gonna have indirect lighting. And um, I, I think that the old light spotlights that are up in the little air um, vent on the building, probably, uh, you know, they're just left over from a previous, a previous owner or a previous uh, business owner. And uh, it would be great if you could come back with something that would be you know, maybe closer to the sign, maybe above the sign, um, but more in keeping with the kinds of lighting, little spotlighting that we've been approving for signs lately. And I know for a while there, we had a certain um, lighting, uh, fixture that Brad Crowell had found. It was a small black kind of a pot light and a very simple, but lit the signs up nicely. And I think a few people have used those and uh, something like that, that would uh, um, not detract from the building um, and kind of go with the sign better would be, something like that would be great. And we can uh, approve that all at the same time. This application is for the hanging sign, not for the sign on the front of the building. That was, going to, that was going to be at a different time. I was going to apply for that sign. And if you don't uh, accept this piece that I've sent in, then I'm going to use the piece that you've already accepted 16 years ago. Uh, what do you... Yeah. If it hasn't been up, I think it's probably, we'd, we'd need to look at it again. I, I would have to probably do the whole application and wait until next month because you only meet once a month. It's right now I have a hanging sign, which is apparently illegal. I've got a little sandwich sign, which is apparently illegal, but it's the only way I can draw business to my store. Well, Amy, well I don't. Oh, temporarily we do allow temporary signs until you get your approval so that I don't yeah and I right and I've checked the box saying that I wouldn't have anything hanging out there and I actually have it now so I'm already in violation <laughs> unless I, you're making acceptance for these sandwich board and hanging signs I I don't I don't think that's the issue I you know the the sign police aren't aren't active on a daily basis John so I think okay. we're, we're okay there we you know, we want to work with you and we want to keep it uh, in, in tune with the other businesses and the other signs. Um, we can also assign a liaison where you could come with the sign. We've could, you understand the parameters at this point? I, I, yeah, I do understand the parameters. Yeah. Like I said, I, I submitted this piece uh, hoping that it would be something that was accepted for the you know, year 2021. I know we're not, you know, I know it's a historical town. I, I've been here, you know, 45 years uh, living out in McCourtney. I've had five different businesses. So I, I understand the, the procedures. I, yeah, I was just hoping that this sign might pass through. I, I didn't give any other choices so that there wasn't any other choices at this point. N now that I hear the comments and understand, uh, I, I'm sure that you would approve the sign that was approved 16 years ago immediately. Um, we'd have to see it, of course. Yeah. Could well, ask, you're, are, you're not proposing a sign, uh, 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 a sign hanging over the sidewalk as well as the building sign, are you? I, I'm, I'm proposing to use my square foot allowance on both the building and the hanging. Well, I think we only get 24 square feet per building. Right, and I've only used 12 feet. Isn't it 12 on each side, so that's 24? No, it's 12 all together I have there. You're talking about it's six side. square feet on each side. It says that it's three times four is 12. Uh, and then, so if you're doing it on two sides, that's 24 square feet. Well, no, it's two feet tall by three feet wide. That's six square feet per side. Oh, okay, the, the, the staff report says it's 12 square feet. So yeah, I've done that. I've done my measurements and calculations to allow for a front building sign as well as a hanging sign. And I know that it's gonna take time to get approval on all these pieces.
Okay. Um, oh, I see. It's four, four by three point six. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, and I and I didn't know it with the application. It doesn't. It says for a sign. It doesn't have room for multiple signs. So it would either have to be multiple applications or a separate application. Uh, that's an Amy question. Amy? We've, we've certainly taken in more than one sign on um, one application. So, um, yeah, and I, I, I relayed that to him after, after the, he had submitted, but, um, but um, yeah, we, we can, you can submit, you know, two signs on one. On, on one application? Yeah, on the single okay. application, that's fine. You know what, uh, John, I'm gonna make a uh, um, suggestion here. Um, we certainly want to work with you. You've got the old sign. You've got two signs. Um, I would be I would be okay with you doing an amendment to your application so you don't have to start all over. Uh, I think we've done that before, Amy. Yeah, that that's fine. I wouldn't I wouldn't have him like repay or anything. We can just okay. See. So just do an amendment. Uh, we want to. You know, you, you know what we want to see? We want to see your 16-year-old sign, make sure that, that that fits, and then the other sign, and apparently you're within the square footage. So um, if we can do that, and you've got signs up, and I know there are people uh, coming by the store, because I've come by the store a couple times. So um, hey. if, if that's okay with you, if um, that would work for us, so we'll take a look at it, and and so glad you're open and to, to use the same application. Just make an amendment to the application you already submitted. I we you we can work together on that, John. Um, okay, I, I can actually just attach a separate sheet, maybe, and then the photo of the uh, sign that I used to use. It's hanging in the store now, uh, screwed to a post right inside the building. Take a picture of it. Yeah, the. You know, back then I was Brothers Antiques. Now I'm Brothers Art and Antiques. So whether the sign guy amends this one or I have a new one done. Uh, what we're interested in is the style of the sign. Yeah. And, and you know, um, and the plain language. But what you just said is plain language. It tells the name of the store and what you do. So. Yeah. It meets yeah. that criteria. Yeah, when I when I filed for this sign back, you know, 16 years ago, one of the people on the committee said, "All I can say is I wish more signs looked like this." Well, I'm anxious to see it. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, I, I I'm yeah, I, I see no reason why this one would be disapproved. So, I'll go ahead and add that as an amendment. And I anything, think, and anything okay. I would put on the front of the building. Uh, all right, and that works for you, Amy. So, um, have we opened it up for the public? I just didn't want to forget oh, that. Oh, good point. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this sign application? I don't see anybody raising their hand. But if if you're on uh, the the if you're one of the, the attendees, please raise your hand if you want to talk. Not seeing anybody. I think we're good. Okay. John, you're good. You're good to go, and uh, I don't think you're going to worry about the sign that's hanging there now. We know it's temporary. Okie doke. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to make a motion to continue, or just have him? Just uh, I guess on the record, we can just indicate that uh, he's going to return with a with an amended sign application. Um. Direction to. Well, we can do a motion just to make it. Uh, a motion to uh, review the new signage um, design next month. So moved. Seconded. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Three zero. Okay, John, you're on your way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Amy, we're into tree removal. We want, I see a steward coming back on. Welcome. Um, 506 Bridgeway, three trees. Amy? All right, and I do think we have our applicant here. Move her over.
Okay. Hi, hi, Virginia. Can you hear us? <clears throat> Virginia is muted. You need to mute, demute. There you go. Are you able to hear us, Virginia? Yes, and I have Marty Dinwiddie here too from oh, 226. Oh, yeah. oh, good. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll keep you on for the next item then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. At this point, uh, Amy is going yeah. to introduce the uh, application here. Uh, property owners Jim and Jenny Knott at 506 Bridge, Bridge Street are requesting removal of two black oak trees, one cherry tree for a total of three trees with diameters ranging between 10 and 32 inches on their 1.22 acre property. Reasons for removal are due to threat to structure and to infrastructure. And that's all I got. Unless okay. Virginia, wants to add anything. Virginia, do you have anything you want to add to that before we uh, have our discussion and take a vote? Um, no, except I get a little nervous seeing the oak trees lean because we had a oak tree fall into our garage about four years ago. So this is our update and this cherry tree that's on the screen now is leaning towards our kitchen. So we're just trying to maintain um, our yard and keep it up to date. We have some gorgeous other trees that we love. Um, looks good to me. Kind of, uh, any comments from the commission? No, they, they all look like they're interfering with the house or the garage and, and there's certainly are lots of other trees still around. So I'm fine. Um, there's no other comments. We'll entertain a motion to approve. The public. <laughs> oh, wait, public. We got the public. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting the public. <laughs> um, if anyone wants to raise your hand to speak, I, I, I think everyone who's on here is on here for an item, an applicant. Sure. sure. Not seeing anyone raising their hand. Anybody want to make a motion? Um, I, have, I have one quick comment. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate the, the pictures. Um, and I won't say it wasn't lost on me that there are some various birdbath things in the yard. So um, I appreciate that. And um, otherwise, I have no, no, uh, no objections to this application. Is that a motion <laughs> to approve? Uh, on that on that note, I would move to approve this application as presented. We have a second. second. I'll second it. Um, I'm, would you call the roll on this, please, Amy? Sure, Commissioner Oberholzer. Yes. Commissioner Nye. Yes. Commissioner Louders. Yes. Chair Van Zant. Yes. Four to zero. Motion carries. And thank you. Num. All right, tree removal, 226 Bridge. Okay, so pro property owner Martha Dinwiddie at 226 Bridge Street is requesting removal of two trees of heaven, two cedars, and two apple trees for a total of six trees with diameters ranging between 7 and 26 inches on her 0 0.11 acre property. Reasons for removal are due to threat to structure and poor health or growth structure. Okay, uh, Martha, do you have any comments or information you'd like us to have? Do you want to say anything? Um, I, oh, yeah. yeah. I, okay. Um, I think that's that's it. the uh, The third one is an old apple tree that it's only uh, two. Um, big branches that need to be cut down because they're dead. But, uh, and that's near the house, but it's not uh, impacting the house. Mm -hmm. um, other ones are impacting, um, that one is impacting the, um, the fence behind it. It's leaning, the fence is leaning and it's, I don't know what's gonna happen to that, but it's, um, it's not looking good. The other one, 
which I'll wait till you put that picture on. Let me know when I get to the one you're, you're wanting to talk okay. about. Okay, this that is one, the this cedar. Is... The cedar, that's the second one to talk about. And that's very, oh, that's the apple tree right yeah. there. The old apple tree okay. um, that we need to have the branches taken off, but not the whole tree. This, this is the cedar you're talking about. And th that is the cedar trees. There's two of them growing very close together and they're very close to the house, leaning uh, toward it and uh, possibly a fire danger too. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioners, any comments? I. I I went by the house this morning and, the, and these trees are, are very much hemming, hemming it in. The cedars are, uh, uh, appear to me to be blocking the, blocking the gate, uh, maybe disturbing the gate. These, uh, it all looks good to me, looks pretty valid. Other comments? No, it makes sense. I concur, makes sense to me too. Um, I would say um, you're very brave to keep that apple tree that close to the house. <laughs> it, looks, <laughs> it looks like it might be a bad yes. house, but um, I'm sure it's, it's um, perhaps a sentimental tree to have around anyway. It's very sentimental. It's very, very old too. Sure. Almost sure. as old as the house. Yeah, that's a big tree. Okay. I, I salute you keeping it. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Uh, motion to approve. Pub public, sorry, can we can we open it up to the public? Oh, public! I keep <laughs> keep reminding me. I'm I'm kind of on the fast track today. <laughs> yeah. Does the public have any comments on this tree removal application? Raise your hand if you have any comments. Not seeing anyone. I think we're okay. Motion, please. Move um, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll second. Do we get a first? <laughs> oh, I thought Lori did. I'm sorry. Lori. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear it all. Okay. Please call the roll, Amy. <laughs> okay. Uh, Commissioner Oberholzer. Yes. Commissioner Nye. Yes. Commissioner Ladders. Yes. Chair Van Zant. Yes. Four to zero. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Before Thank you. We're going to sign off now. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, be oh. I hear somebody talking besides me. Okay. Uh, before we go to architectural review, there's four of them. Uh, what I want to do is um, rotate the comments in order. This is something that uh, we were doing when I was first on the uh, uh, commission. I thought it worked well, everybody gets a chance. So, I, so I'm gonna propose that uh, we go in the order of Stu, Tom and Lori for this one. And then second one, we'll start with Tom and then Lori and Stu and I get to go last because I'm the chair on each of these. So if, if, if the three of you are okay with that rotation, um, we'll use that for architectural review. Uh, will you call on us, Peter? That'd I will call in order. Yes, I will. Okay, thank you. And I believe uh, Rachel Faft from the, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the company that you're from, but she's from the generator uh, company. <clears throat> Uh, the existing residence was constructed in 1990, according to assessor records. In September 2020, Council adopted Ordinance 2020-17, establishing a process for processing commercial and residential stationary generators to be used in the event of an emergency electrical power outage. Provisions of the ordinance require that generators with public outputs between 10,000 and 20,000 watts be processed through an architectural review process. The applicant is proposing a new 20,000 watt generator to be located in the rear yard of the residence. 
Um, and so the one thing I'll, I'll have you, because we, we didn't exactly have, we, we made it this through, through the our architectural review applications. So the finding is really that it's compatible with the, um, you know, Nevada City architecture. Um, and I just added a, you know, a, a blurb that it, it's, it, you can consider it compatible um, when it doesn't detract from the overall aesthetic of the Nevada City architecture. So I just wanted you to be aware that that's, that's something I recommended in the findings. So, and that's all I have. Okay, um, applicant, would you like to uh, address us? Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. The client is asking for a automatic standby generator for backup power, uh, mostly due to the PG&E power outages. Uh, there we go, we got the map up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you for that. Uh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to, let's do the public first. Is there anybody on the public that would like to comment on this application? Sorry, let me go. Okay. I'm okay, then uh, then I'll call on Stu for his comments first, and then Tom, and then Lori. Thank you, Amy. Amy, if you have any um, reason to interrupt me, that please. <laughs> no, I just I can't see the, the when I have when I'm sharing my screen. I it's it's a little hard for me to see the attendee. So I'll, I'll I'll figure it out if if attendee has their hand raised, just let me know, and I'll 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 find I'll figure out how to find you. <laughs> But go ahead, Stuart. All right. Um, I note that the uh, the generators in the back of the property off of the street. Um, Amy, did we receive any letters um, from neighbors who were objecting to the installation of this generator? No. Uh, but but keep in mind, we do. Why well, I, I don't notice anyone in you know if, for architectural review, so they they don't have notice either. But um, I have not received any objections. Okay, I note that it's in the back of the house. It's not going to be seen from the street, and I don't have any particular concerns about this application. Thank you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Stu. Tom, uh, I don't see any problems with this either. Thanks, Lori. Um, I don't see any problems either. As we get these applications, I I review. I think of what I look at first is uh, if you can see it from the street and. You know, mostly we're not seeing that. I thought we had put that in the ordinance, but it doesn't quite read that way. Um, but in general, they haven't been visible from the street. And this one certainly isn't, it's under a deck. Um, and then the second thing is if it seems so close to a neighbor that we might wanna raise, you know, some kind of a, a question about moving it. But so anyway, this one doesn't meet any of my internal criteria, but I do have a question, Amy. Are they required to do this backflow? thing with this permit, the backflow backflow prevention. Yeah, generally, yeah, we, we require any um if if they don't have one on file already, they do have to do a, a backflow prevention device. But people are asking me how much does it cost when people come in for these. Well so we a couple of years ago we did change the criteria on those so, so that you don't need to have a, a plumber or somebody install them. A homeowner can install them. There's no cost um, to get an inspection. And, you know, those, so the cost of actually purchasing it, I don't know, but there's no cost to actually getting an inspection from the city. The oh, okay. City just, you just call our public works department, they will come out and inspect, so. Okay, so uh, Amy, for clarity, if we see that notation in the app, in your staff report, that means they don't have one on record, so that is part of the uh, approval. Did, did I put that in the conditions here? I don't so, have it in front of me. I, don't know, I, thought, I thought I saw a picture of it or something. Yeah, there was a, it was your standard. Uh, it may be included in the permit pack because this particular client uh, already had it. Oh, so okay. he actually has the inspection attached in the, the permit. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're just letting letting me know that it's already there. Yeah. Okay. All right. And call for any public comment on this one. We did that already, and no, we no. Did that? 
Okay. Yeah, but I wasn't able to see it, the attendees, so it's okay. Ask again. I seem to be having a problem with the public today. I got a feeling we'll get we'll get to some public as we move on. Um, yeah. Laurie. Yeah, we we're supposed to we were supposed to listen to the public comment before we make our comments because we're supposed to be considering it. So maybe it's easier to remember if we remember it, it goes first. That's okay, all. thank you. Uh, I think we're ready for a motion to approve. Well, I'm going to make a motion to approve the architectural review application. Um, subject to the conditions of approval. And we've made no additional conditions. Thank you. Second. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Well, Lori, uh, Amy, would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Oberholzer? Yes. Commissioner Nye? Yes. Commissioner Louders? Yes. And Chair Van Zant? Yes. Four to zero, motion carries. Moving right along, we are now to Valley Street. All right, let me get there. Amy? Yes, give me just a second here. Or is it the awning? I think we're at the awning one. I think that one's next. Where are we here? Uh, item number. Oh, yes, seven. you're right. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the audience. I did see. So I'm going to have to recuse myself on items seven and nine because of proximity. And I will excuse myself for the time being. And thank you. Amy, do you want to uh, introduce us? Yes, and I've brought the applicant in there. Kamiko, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, and we'll give a brief staff report. Uh, records show that the subject structure was constructed in 1862 and it is depicted on the 1898 Sanborn map. The building has been divided into several lower and upper level tenant spaces. It is considered a contributing building to the National Register and I've included the description um, that's in the register. Uh, in the staff report there. Uh, the building currently hosts a theater on the upper level and a retail space and the Sushi Q restaurant on the, the lower level. And um, the staff report shows the Sanborn map and um, I tried to point out the section of this. And I, I just found a whole bunch of um, photos of this building or a, a few photos of this building. Um, so I just, I included those because I, I like to do that <laughs> if I have them. Um, the tenant and, and business owner, Kamiko Kadera, is requesting to replace two of the existing awnings spanning the entrance and front windows. The current awning features a cream and burgundy striped fabric material and mm. was approved by the Planning Commission in October 2002. The replacement awnings um, are proposed to be a solid burgundy fabric. And um, with that, I'm going to just pull up, share my screen so you can see the windows we're talking about. And um, that is all I have. Ah, uh, yes, I think we're all familiar with the, the locations. Um, and the applicant is here. Do you have a comment for us, please? Okay, well, our uh, awning is getting really old and lipped, and it looks really bad. So we wanted to uh, re renew, but they didn't have that same public, I mean, fabric and same pattern. So we chose the one of the cutter, it's in it. So that was it. And we have a swatch of the, the proposed fabric and the color in the application. And Amy's going to that now, I believe. There we go. Yeah, that, yeah, that is it. Um, Thank you for your input. Appreciate it. And I we I really wanted to do that, you know, same thing. I mean, we didn't we didn't want to change anything, but we just couldn't find the uh, same pattern. And the awning company, she said that she didn't she does not have it. So okay, so we'll deal with uh, a solid one. That'll that's part of the application. Then. Yes. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, now we'll go to the public. Is that is there anybody waving their hands? I'm not seeing any hands waving. Okay. So thank you. We're coming back to the commission and we'll stop, start with uh, Mr. Nye. Uh, the uh, I, I was looking at the storefront a couple of days ago, and, and this is going to be a great improvement, brighten it up. And uh, I have a question. It's uh, the, the shape of the awning will remain the same. It's just a change of the fabric? Yes. We're not going to change anything except the fabric. Um, I have no, uh, no problems at all with this application. Thank you. Lori? Hi, Kamiko. Hello. <laughs> I approve. I was the one who signed the uh, approval. Yes. Of the last 2002. <laughs> I just saw that. Yes. This lasted a long time. 18 I know. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like it. I mean, we always look to make sure these things are mother load in style, which it certainly is. It's simple and canvassy looking. So I think it'll be nice to have it freshened up. Thank so you, I, thank you. Yeah, good job. Thanks. And I agree with both of my commissioners here who uh, and their comments. Um, thank you for the upgrade, and I think the uh, I think the solid color is going to be actually very attractive and outstanding. So, oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's you know, I'm not an artist, but you know, I, <laughs> I I do eat out and I do see things on the street. So thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? Uh, I move we approve the application uh, as shown with no modifications. I'll second it. Amy, want to call roll, please? Commissioner Oberholzer? Yes. Commissioner Nye? Yes. Chair Van Zant? Yes. Motion carries three to zero. Good luck with it. Look forward to seeing it. Great. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, now we're at Valley Street. Yes, and hold on, let me, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't see the applicant on. I don't know if there's, there is one person I don't recognize. So if any of you are here to represent 401 Valley Street, can you raise your hand? Not seeing any hands raising. So I'm not sure we have the applicant, but um, I will go through. Uh, let me, can we go out? Well, if the, under our protocol, if the applicant does not um, show up or appear or want to say anything, we can still go ahead and make our recommendations and motions, correct? But yeah, I think if you're not changing, I mean, if you're not asking him to change anything, so it would be, I, okay. I, I think we'd want to give him an uh, if you're planning on asking him to revise anything, we'd probably want to continue it. So, uh, more I, questions about what the, about the application. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you want to introduce it, please? Yes. Sorry. Give me just one second here. Okay. So, um, Property owner Bill Wallace was approved for an extensive remodel of the existing residence in 2017. Neither a garage or, or a residence at 401 Valley Street are depicted on the 1898 or 1912 Sam Moore maps, um, at least not in the, the areas where, um, where the current house is or current garage, or sorry, there's no current garage, this will be a new garage. The applicant is proposing a new 576 square foot detached garage situated to the north of the existing residence. It will feature horizontal wood siding and composition shingle roof to match the residence. It will also feature two upper dormers, though there is no upper story and no living space proposed within the structure. And that is what I have. And they still have not joined us. Okay, um, let's proceed to our, uh, to the public. Any public comments? Anyone raising your hand for the to, to make public comment on this application? Not seeing anyone. I can hardly guess what the public is here for, but we'll we'll proceed. Uh, we'll start off with Lori uh, comments. How many people are sitting out there, Amy? 
there, there's only four, and uh, <laughs> most of them I recognize, and we they're, can't tell. they're gonna be on, yeah, yeah their applicants. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's my turn. Um, well, let's see, the only question I have of Amy on this one is, is it 30 feet back, it meets the setback, the front yard setback? Yes, actually, I actually prepared, here, let me, let me. Oh, sorry, I just didn't notice it. I, um, I prepared a, because he had the wrong setbacks on there, so I did prepare some setbacks. It's one of my attachments. Okay, so it's 30 feet back. Yeah. It, okay. This one is it's funny because he's he's got the um it's he's got a corner side, so you, you basically have to choose one. So if you choose one, it's not it doesn't meet it. And if you choose it, it here, this is the one. I'll, I'll show. Let me share my screen here. Oh, we had to pick what was the front the front yeah. setback. Yeah. And it wasn't so much that the front wouldn't make it, it was, it was then the garage would, would not have made it. He's, the house is, is already legal non-conforming no matter how you slice it. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's an old house. Yeah. So the garage meets the setbacks then. Yes, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, that's good. Um, I, I think, uh, well, this is one of those examples of, of somebody really doing it right. It's a, our guidelines uh, speak to the fact that um, we have a whole section on garages because in the traditional neighborhoods, and this is largely a traditional uh, architecture neighborhood, lots of lots of old houses, we, we pretty much require detached garages, which is it's wonderful that he's proposed it to be detached and um, he's, he's matching the house. It's using all wood, everything except uh, the windows, which don't have to be when they're outside of the historical district and um, the gables are in keeping with the style of the building. Um, oh, and the garage doors are even mentioned uh, in our design guidelines, I believe. And he has very traditional looking carriage house type doors. So um, yeah, so I think it's a wonderful addition. I wouldn't uh, ask for any changes at all. Okay, uh, thank you. And um, let's see, we are going to Stu. Um, you joined us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think Lori captured it perfectly. I don't have any questions or comments or concerns. Um, love to see the, the matching siding that matches the house. Looks, looks great to me, and I have no problems. Mr. Nye. Um, looks good to me too. It's uh, there's some very nice things happening at that at that uh, property, and this is no exception. Um, looks all good. Turn that off. And my comment echoes the previous ones. Um, I remember when this application came, and we looked at the house before and after. It was done a really, really nice job and uh, that corner is looking good. And I think the garage is gonna look good and be functional. So um, if we're ready to move, we're ready to, uh, I'm ready for a motion. I'll move for approval. Second. Amy, would you call the roll please? Commissioner Oberholzer? Yes. Commissioner Nye? Yes. Commissioner Louders? Yes. Chair Van Zant. Yes. Four to zero, motion carries. All righty, and thank you. All righty, now we are going to um, Broad Street, 414 Broad. Uh, Stuart, I think you are. Uh, yep. Are you coming back after this? Is there's. I absolutely will come back. Okay. Oh, yeah, we got to. Okay. The presentation. Let me bring Alrighty. applicants over. Give me just one second here. Um, okay, I've got Cooper and Steve um, coming in. Um, I will go ahead and start my report. On January 27th, 2021, the residence on the subject property was completely destroyed by fire. Assessor records indicate a construction date of the previous residence to be 1880. The 1898 Sandbar map indicates that the property was used as a dwelling at that time, and the National Registry uh, Historic District Inventory describes the building 
um, yeah, as a contributing building and I've got a description there in the staff report. The applicants are proposing to construct a new one-story residence totaling approximately 1,000 square feet. Um, and, I, and Steve did correct me that um, there is a, a little upper level area. So the 1,000 square feet is the footprint. I believe he said there's about a 500 square foot area up on the top. Um, so the total square footage will be closer to, I think, 1,500. And um, when the applicant speaks, he can maybe just correct that number if, if that's wrong. But, um, but 1,000 square feet is the footprint. Um, on so it'll be substantially the same footprint as a prior residence. The applicant is proposing to extend the gabled portion of the residence by six feet and increase the height of by approximately 18 inches. The building will also be shifted away from 416 Broad Street by six to eight inches, and that's um, to help with maintenance. As indicated in the applicant statement, these changes are intended to accommodate standard eight foot ceilings while maintaining a reasonable roof pitch in the back shed roof section and will also avoid obscuring a window on the neighboring building. Uh, proposed materials include milled wood siding to match the prior building's siding profile, wood dual paned windows and energy with energy efficient glass, tin awnings will be replicated over the eastern side windows and over the front door, uh, paint colors will be consistent with the original structure featuring a white body and dark green window trim, and the roof will be uh, feature a 12 to 12 pitch and be composition shingle in, in a color like the original. And that is all I have right now. I, I, the one other thing I'll note is I, I indicated on this, the um, attachments that there's a demolition application. I didn't ask the applicant to actually do a demolition and I'm not asking you to make the findings for a demolition. It's pretty well demolished. So, um, but with that, I, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, Mr. Levy, would you like to uh, address the this uh, application for us, please. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I, I guess there were uh, a few things. One, one to comment on the, the square footage. I think it'll be closer to maybe 300 square feet um, in the upper floor. So th 1,300 total, um, it, at least as proposed. Um, so I, I think, yeah, when, when we went into um, escrow on the building, we're, we're still in uh, escrow, so we did not own the property at the moment. Um, you know, the, the building was still, um, I guess, the original building. And we understood at that time, you know, of course, it's, it's a historical building. It's been around for 140 years. And, and we should try to preserve, um, you know, everything that we can from the building and, and maintain the structure. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, at this point, the, you know, all of the historic, you know, value in the building is, it's unfortunately gone. There's no original material. Um, and, and so to some extent, this is, you know, this is um, new construction. Um, and, and so along these lines, right, we want to make sure we're adhering to, to modern building codes, but at the same time, really, you know, um, maintaining sort of the design guidelines that the city is, you know, uh, set forth and sort of the, the municipal codes, as well as sort of, you know, the standards set by the, um, the Secretary of the Interior. And, and so along these lines, you know, I think, um, with I think the municipal code section uh, 1788040B, you know, sort of, I think gives a good summary as to the, the intent we were going for here. You know, so the idea is we're supposed to, um, you know, stick with the Nevada city architecture style of, you know, mother load architecture um, and, and sort of the historical value site coverage, planning, volume, massing, materials, and, and design details. And, and so in terms of um, the, the historic, you know, value. This is clearly mother load architecture, and it's it's very similar to the original building. Um, we're, we're trying to retain a lot of the the interesting characteristics, such as you know the um, very sunk uh, you know front entry, um, the the irregular windows on the building. Um, actually, the the eastern side of the building, none of the windows match, and I think that's it's sort of interesting, and it, it shows the, how the building has evolved over time. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, volume and massing of the you know Nevada City architecture, and in particular this block, um, that we are proposing a slight height increase, but it's still uh, significantly shorter than both uh, 416 and 418, the two neighboring properties. Um, and, and really, this is sort of a about a six to seven percent increase in the overall height of the building. But what it does allow is for us to um, you know maintain this back shed uh, section of the building, the shed roof section, which was added. And I, I think, you know, with modern plumbing, um, which is, you know, I think a historically relevant addition, uh, definitely pre-World War II. And, and so we can have the ceilings in there be 
compliant with modern building codes, but also sort of maintain this um, interesting way of adding onto the building. Um, and, and so I think, you know, yeah, our, uh, the materials we're planning to use are also, um, you know, consistent with original materials. Uh, we're trying to match them as closely as possible. Um, and, and I think the, the one thing I do want to say is uh, additionally, being that there is nothing historic, you know, unfortunately, in terms of the materials left in the building, and this is new construction, we don't want to make it a, an identical cookie cutter replica. Um, that's, I think that sort of goes a little against what the, the Department of the Interior is, is going for, and this is, this is new construction. So we're trying to match the style without making an identical replica. So I think that's, yeah, that's most of what I have to say. We're happy to answer any questions, of course. Um, any questions of um, staff or Mr. Levy at this point? Um, wait a second, hold on. let's 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 hold up. let's let's do the public first, okay? And then we'll have questions and then we'll have our discussion. Amy, are there hands up now? Yes, I do have a hand up here. So here, I'm going to stop my share because it's a little easier. But I can put anything back up if you guys want. Oops, sorry. Okay. Kathy, you're, uh, you're on and you're welcome to address the commission. Greetings, uh, Daniel Ketchum, president of Nevada County Historical Society. Uh, we're broadcasting from the historical uh, a library, and I'm using Kathy's uh, computer, obviously. Uh, thank you for allowing me to comment on the, uh, the request. Um, it's kind of my usual mantra about just asking the commission to kind of follow the rules. Uh, we're concerned about uh, any variances that are, are, are kind of special to a particular property or property owner. Um, they, they need to be granted only if, um, if there's a special hardship or condition here. And I'm specifically uh, uh, speaking to the uh, request to increase the height of the building. Um, I think it was pretty well articulated in the letter which you all received, hopefully. Uh, so we're asking you just to pay attention to uh, the, the historical district ordinance and hopefully maintain the, the height of the existing building. We, we like everything else about the proposal. Um, but as we spoke to in the letter, um, is kind of the, uh, the, the tail wagging the dog when you're trying to uh, increase the height of a building because of a structure out back. Um, our suggestion is change the structure out back rather than changing the height of the building. Particularly concerned about driving at Broad Street and uh, you can only potentially no longer see the uh, uh, steeple, so to speak, of the uh, firehouse next door and it just impact uh, on viewscape when it's gonna, when it, how it will change the uh, elevation of the buildings there. Um, so thank you for uh, allowing me to comment on it and uh, uh, wish you luck on the, on the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Amy, do we have? We only got one other person in the attendees. Uh, does that person want to comment? <laughs> Can you raise your hand if you do? Hmm. I'm not, not, oh, seeing, not seeing anything. Okay, well that went that went fast. Um, okay, we will bring it back to the council, and we'll be starting with uh, Tom. We're we doing questions first. Are we on to questions? Okay, yes. I, I do have a question. Uh, um, thank you. It's a it's a it's a really nice it's a really nice presentation. Very thorough, and I, I appreciate. Uh, the applicant's uh, desire to do a, 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 a near a near duplication of the original building um, that's greatly appreciated. You know, switching materials, even though they're the same um, uh, appearance, it makes a big difference. Say to switch out cement board for actual wood. Uh, has a real a real difference. It makes a real difference in, in the actual aesthetic and feel uh, of the building. So um, I appreciate your your willingness to uh, to go right there and replace the siding um, uh, uh, to duplicate the original as much as possible. The width um, uh, I, I like that very much. 
Um, um, the question I have, which is technical in nature, is the space that um, that is proposed between the uh, the two adjacent buildings, six to eight inches. Um, I'm wondering if if that if that spacing has been coordinated with the uh, with the owner next door. I, I don't I don't right off the top of my head know the uh, the, the other fire damaged building. If uh, if a space would be um, helpful or a hindrance to maintenance, and if it uh, if it might be a, a a good thing to communicate with that owner and coordinate your plans, uh, because uh, may, maybe a weather tight a weather tight joint between the two uh, would be appropriate because uh, the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, um, thanks. For, thanks for for sharing that, Amy. Um, is that's is that enough room to actually get into? Yeah. So I this is a a good question. And actually, so the original building, um, the the gabled portion in the front was all separated by about sixteen inches. Um, and and this had actually when the the bakers um, renovated four sixteen. They're also the the current owners back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, they actually weren't able to replace the siding in the, the area where the two buildings sort of, um, you know, are close to each other. So, um, and towards the back portion, the buildings are actually attached to each other um, originally. So the, uh, you know, 414, when they did the, the shed roof addition, uh, it was sort of nailed to 416. So our, um, what we're doing is by adding another six to eight inches, this should give us uh, about, you know, a little over two feet between the two buildings okay. and, and the hope is yeah it, it would be very tight but i think it's it's much better than this sort of you know 16 inches where you know you, you can barely even step in there so i, I think it's it, again the alternative is we use something like you know cement board siding there or something that doesn't really need replacement over time and i, I thought my personal opinion was this was maybe a a good compromise so yeah and we have spoke with the bakers and they um they understand that yeah, I guess that we're proposing this. Okay, that that yeah, that answers my question. Uh, I, I was regarding the two as actually conjoined, and I wondered at, at one point if if four sixteen was leaning on four fourteen or vice versa. Um, yeah, no, there's a little fence in the front um, that's about okay. sixteen inches wide that was sort of covering up the gap. Right. All right. Well, that's yeah. That is a that is a, a, a sufficiently accessible gap and good. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, that you guys had worked that out, uh, the bakers and you. Um, um, yeah. That's that's all I have. Thank you, Tom. Um, let me jump in here just a second. I also talked to Richard Baker, and he. He confirmed that they're okay with that space and uh, with the placement. So, uh, so that that's another answer to your question, um, Lori. You're up. Yeah, I have uh, just a number of questions just to make sure that we get it in the record what what's happening here. Um, but first, I want to let everybody know that I did speak to Mr. Levy outside the meeting. We're required under the Brown Act to let you know if we've spoken to anybody in the outside world uh, about these projects. And so I did speak to him. I was really careful not to say anything about how I may or may not vote. And um, I just kept it to, you know, he kind of described the project to me and, and I, you know, told him about some of our regulations and uh, that was, that was pretty much it really didn't get uh, much out of it other than um, what's already in the staff report. Otherwise I would report that to you. So, but here's my questions of Mr. Levy. I think most of these questions are gonna be for you. Um, just so that we'll know, what's, what was the height of the ceiling in the main structure, um, the house, before the fire, before it burned down, the, sort of the existing situation? Yeah, so it was uh, it was actually ten and a half foot ceiling. So it's sort of for such a small building, uh, you know, very Victorian uh, ceiling heights. Yeah, that and, was typical, even in small small buildings. So it, it was at ten and a half feet. Yes. What what's the ceiling height in the main structure going to be after? Nine and a half feet. It'll go down a little bit. Uh, down a little bit. Yeah, it's okay. still you know very very close to sort of the Victorian heights, much taller than eight eight feet in the gabled section. 
And so then what's happening inside, what will, the, what will, what will be different in the uh, attic space? Um, so, so the attic space will, there should be enough space to do a, I guess, based on the, the numbers, you know, the, the gabled section is about 30 feet long, um, or a little, I guess a little more than that. Um, will basically have a, a room or, you know, a, I guess an improved space um, up there as well to, to make use of sort of this uh, very tall section that, I mean, it was a tall in the original building, almost nine and a half feet of, um, or I guess a little over nine and a half feet of, uh, you know, sloped roof there. In so the attic. We're adding, yeah, a little bit to that so that the space can be a little bit wider up there. Was that an improved usable space before? No. Okay. Um, and then how are you going to get up there? Will the stairs or were there stairs before? Uh, no, I mean, it was, it was just an attic space. It wasn't improved in any way. That, so there so, will be stairs. Yeah. Okay. And then um, let's see. Okay. So basically you're saying that you raised it so that you could get the shed roof higher in the back. Um, my question on that is, uh, was there any other way that you could have, that you could, or is there any other way you could accommodate the, the shed roof in some shape or the shed, you know, the, the shed structure such that you wouldn't need the additional foot and a half on top of the room? Is there any way to do that? Um, I, I think it, it starts to get into an area where you, you end up having to sort of change the footprint either by, you know, shrinking the, the dimension of the shed section, um, you know, parallel to Broad Street. Um, so, so I guess, um, yeah, and th there might be um, a way, but yeah, I mean, you, you can't really reduce the height of it again due to sort of, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the, uh, the basement that's underneath um, pre-existing. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I guess without really modifying significantly the the shed section, um, that does get a little challenging. Um, oh. I guess so, so. Maybe can I also make one comment? I guess the the eighteen inches when we we did you know look at that. I guess I've submitted a, an elevation as well um, with four sixteen, <laughs> and and sort of a, a view looking up the street, and and um, I guess also this sort of you know, um, comments on a, a point that Mr. Ketchum made was that, you know, the, uh, you are still able to see the steeple of the church. You're actually still able to see looking up the street, um, even part of the roof of 416. So we're, we're still substantially lower than the existing building. Yeah, that sketch really helped. I asked you to do that because I couldn't understand what was going to happen between the two. No, I'm, I'm glad you asked, um, you, you know, you brought up, this would be very helpful because I think it is, um, I think it is good to show that, yeah, they, the relation is still very, very similar. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my next question is, Amy, could you take it back to that side view again on York Street? Yeah, sorry, it's a, it's a different uh, location, yeah. Hold on, I gotta, gotta go find it here. Oh, this there one. it is, yeah, that one. Um, so when you're looking at the building, you can see, this is what the Historical Society, well, I think Dan brought this up. Um, when you look at the building, you can see the, the couple of, of, you know, the peak of the little tower on the um, firehouse number one or two. Is it firehouse number one? Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, will the foot and a half block that view from this vantage point? This is um, from... I, I to be honest, I, I do not have a view from exactly this vantage point in the, the sort of the, the private property parking lot of the New York Hotel. Um, but if you're standing on the sidewalk of Broad Street, it does not obscure it in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, I mean, this is also sort of a perspective thing. Of course, if you're standing right, if you know you move this picture forward two or three feet, of course, you're going to obscure the cupola as well. So it's, okay. um, yeah, but I think most views that you see in most photos, actually, I've never, um, I, you know, personally, uh, in my searches of the internet, I've never found a photo from this exact point um, that, that actually sh shows the entire um, okay. eastern facing side. So that, that yeah. Okay. So let's switch to the Broad Street. We don't have to change it, Amy, but um, the Broad Street, uh, the little um, 
the little overhang, the little metal overhang that was there before that you're putting back. Neil Locke sent us a picture, I think, or, or I, he sent us a something that I, it seemed to allude to the fact that perhaps that uh, it would be better to make that a wooden structure rather than a metal structure. And that would be more in keeping with the way it had been in the 1800s that this metal thing probably happened in the 50s or the 60s. So what, I mean, is that something that you would maybe be interested in um, accommodating that concern? I don't know. We don't have to talk about that now. We can do it when we discuss it, but. Um, no, that's, um, I, I guess I can, if I can speak to that right now. Yeah, I um, basically what, uh, what we had done was, I guess originally, if you look in some photos, there was actually a um, almost like a whole structure that, ex you know, extended the width of the building and covered yeah, the sidewalk that. as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, a very large structure. Um, the building has been this way for a very long time as well as it is right now. Um, so I think this allows a little more light in the building and it, it sort of, um, that was why I think we stuck with this. But yeah, the exact materials of the over the overhang part, our, our goal was to keep it um, very similar. Yeah, that's um, one that I guess shows this, one, this large yeah. overhang that covers the entire sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but the exact materials, um, we were just trying to keep something similar to in size what's been on the building for, yeah. you know, I guess at least since the, the pictures were taken for the National Register application. Yeah, well, our rule is that you're, you're, we're only supposed to do, um, you know, rebuilds and renovations if you have a picture of, ex of exactly that change. And um, we don't actually have a picture of the little um, overhang in wood, but I think Neil's probably right. We could we could visualize that it would have been done that way at some point in wood. Instead. But we can talk about it when we get to discussion. Um, so now the back of the building where you have your little deck and all of that, can I ask you, um, I didn't see any dimensions on the height of the railings. And everybody knows I always bring that up because it's it's really important in the historic district to keep that lower railing height and we're allowed to do that under the historic building code and so uh what what's the height of your railing around the deck oh my my apologies um i yeah th this is not i think a, a a point of contention for us it was um <laughs> basically <laughs> it ends up the the railings that were on the pre-existing deck had sort of been sheared off and you could sort of see the the posts and the corners um but there was no railing so that's uh, yeah um a, a very fine detail that I did not. Um, the yeah. guidelines actually speak to no higher than 36 inches, 31 to 36 inches is what we look for. And that, that has that. Uh, yeah, I, I completely understand. And that's, that's, um, that would be acceptable. Okay. Yeah. And then as long as we're on that picture, you, the, the, the bottom is the before and the top is the after, but you were, you were sticking to the same size windows and you've gone larger um, on this one. So what's your? We did we did go larger on this one window, um, and and this was uh, again um, to get a little more light into the space since we were going to use this an improved space. Um, but uh, again, this is not, um, you know, I think that was sort of the the main goal. Yeah, to get some light in, that was the the reasoning for this decision. Okay, and then um, it's not really clear uh, in the application under your discussion of materials, um, if they're gonna be wood windows, true wood windows, not clad or anything. Oh, I believe, I, my, my apologies, I think it is, but if, if it's not, yes, the, they should be all wood windows. That's the, Yeah, we, we require wood windows in the- Yeah, floor. and we understood that, that was, um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, another little question, have you thought about with that gap between the two buildings being a little wider, do we need some sort of a little um, wrought iron fence or something to keep um, trespassers from going through there? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not shown, but again, we can um, replace something similar to what was there before. Oh, I don't remember what was there. Okay. Oh, there's a, in the, basically on the Broad Street side, there's a, um, there's a little sort of white fence that's, um, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 feet tall um, mm -hmm. that spans between 414 and 416. Okay. To close the gap from Broad Street. All right. And then I have a question of Amy, which is when, um, when are we going to, at what point will we get final drawings with everything dimensioned out 
Um, well, so generally that that will come to me after we after architectural review is approved. So once he has some uh, elevations approved through you guys, um, and then if, if you want a liaison to be assigned to this, then um, I would send those those plans to the liaison as well. Yeah, I think a liaison would be good because some of the little fussy details like exactly how the window sills look and those kinds of things that are really important, uh, have, we haven't seen yet, but obviously, you know, that's a liaison kind of thing. Okay, well, I think that's all of my questions. Back oh. to you, Peter. Okay. <laughs> I think all of my questions have been answered. Um, going back to the uh, overhang over the front door, um, I, uh, Neil got a hold of me also. I, there was a picture there where it looked actually like a damaged Venetian blind. And I'm not, not sure what it was, but it was certainly not wood. So, uh, so we've got that condition uh, handled. Um, the, the first proposal we had on, uh, this, on a replacement for this unfortunate fire building uh, was kind of shocking to me, if you remember it. So I'm, I'm happy that we're going with the same style, the natural, you know, the natural materials, uh, working with the neighbor. I think overall, we're, uh, you know, Broad Street's going to look Good again. It's, you know, the, those two buildings being burned out is still shocking to me. But I don't have any additional questions at this point. So um, we're going to bring it back to the commission if there's any interplay between us or additional comments or whatever. Uh, I'm I uh, I'm fine with the I'm fine with going forward with this. Um, it's, uh, you know, even though it's not a demolition, we, we basically have to use the same rules because there was a historic structure there and now there's not. And, you know, that's what we've done in other cases the the Elks building um, burned down and they had to bring it back exactly the way it was and did a good job of that. So um, we're pretty close to that here. The foot and a half increase was a concern, but that front elevation, I, I, I don't think it will be um, perceptible. I think if we're gonna approve this, I would like to add an intent um, sentence to it. So it's really clear that this is not um, a precedent for um, in increasing you know, the height of buildings anytime somebody comes in just for a renovation or something in the historic district. Um, but I think we should probably add talk about each of the things we discussed here and make sure they're added to the application in the in the motion that we definitely want wooden windows since it wasn't mentioned um, that we'd like the the little Lori Lori yeah Excuse me. why Wait don't why don't we listen we'll get some questions that Tom has them uh, then when we get to the motion it'll be appropriate for to add the conditions. All that. Got it. About. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you have any additional comments? No. Um, uh, well, yes. Uh, the uh, the awning over the front door. Um, I, I get the gesture that, that uh, Mr. Levy's proposing, and I'm not in opposition to it. But I think I think some further clarification as to um, what what the bracket detail would be and and whether as a whole it's it's a it's a, a historically appropriate treatment uh, because the the awning that was there before was as Lori said um, a 50s or 60s sort of uh, Sears thing and I actually I used to love it because it, it's it was a sort of kitschy part of the progress of history etc but uh, we're uh, uh, um, uh, Mr. Levy is, is doing just a beautiful job of a historic restoration thing, and, and uh, um, we should we should definitely examine the awning over the front door further because it's such a strong part of the Broad Street presentation. Um, 
and and uh, and then on the on the height change, uh, um, I, I'm I'm very much with the historic society and 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 um, the uh, the desire for a restoration um, or you know an exact replacement structure, but it's it's so it's so delightfully close to the original um, and the increased height does increase usability and it helps to retain the original shape including the the rear uh, shed addition um, and makes it quite usable and legitimate so I, I I personally don't think the 18 inches additional height is is a problem um, uh, oh, I would I would like to um, focus a bit on the size of the rear gable window. It it seems a bit out of scale with the lower story in that elevation. Um, I don't know exactly where to proceed from there, um, but that's my feeling looking at it. It's a, it's, it's a bit out of scale with the lower story windows, though, though the desire for more light is appreciated. Um, it's a very tall window and the width is nice and, and maybe the height could be reduced to make a more balanced elevation. Um, and, and I would think more in keeping with the style of the time. That's all, that's all I have at this point. My comment on that would be, I concur with Tom. Um, nice to have um, a builder architect in the, on the commission. So good eyes, thank you. Um, I think we are fine to go. Um, a motion to, to basically accept the concept and then the conditions that we've discussed. And so we get them in one by one. And then after that, we'll do a liaison and, you know, go from okay. there. And um, this is such a main, I don't expect, this is for Amy, I don't expect major changes from the presentation that, you know, we've talked about changes, but nothing, nothing really major. Uh, but I assume it will, the final will be coming back to us. Is that uh, correct? Typically, um, typically it doesn't come back to the commission, the final plans. Um, it, it will go to the, the commissioner liaison. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to send it around, but I, I kind of would hesitate because um, I, I, I really want to just work with the liaison at that point. Um, I think that the, um, the little window and the, uh, the bracketing, uh, the work on the front um, entry with the appropriate bracket and all um, is simple enough that it's not going to hold Mr. Levy up. But I think those, just those should come back to the, to the full group. And then the liaison can do all the other minor stuff as things come up. Okay. So what I'll probably have you do is uh, make, make your motion with, with direction to come back with, uh, with a, a different proposal for that, for the, the awnings over the, and I'm assuming you mean, mean over the, those two windows on the New York Hotel side and, and, the, and the awning over the door, is that correct? Just the window at the back, it's the- Oh, the win oh just the window in the back, that's the yeah, one. Oh, yeah. I was talking about, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. so we can, we can have him um, come back with just that detail, so. Do you want me to list everything from the mo in the motion, Peter? Sure. I'm going to make the motion. And Can I interrupt for just a second? I, I actually, I, I, I think the front, uh, the the front awning, and and that would relate to the side awnings as well, um, are are pretty important architecturally, and maybe should be in, in, uh, included in the. Oh, you're right. I missed in the, the revision. Side too. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There, there, there are so many ways to go with those, and and. Um, I'm not personally. I'm not opposed aesthetically in the time to a uh, to a corrugated tin uh, awning, but the details are really important, and and uh, uh, there are there are ways, many ways to do it, and um, mm -hmm. that that may be uh, that may be slightly beyond the scope of a of a liaison's 
uh, sole discretion. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And following on that comment, Tom, uh, I think you're suggesting that the awning, if there's awnings on the side, that it be the, they be the same material as the awning in front. It, that would seem appropriate. Uh, uh, maybe this is an opportunity for Mr. Levy to weigh in on. Yeah, I, I, on yeah, I think so. That that actually, I think that's stated in the proposal. That was the awnings on the side are pre-existing um, in in the structure, and they have a very a very simple architectural detail for the um, the bracket. It's sort of just a few pieces of wood that um, with an angle, and that was our intent with the front was to replicate those pre-existing awnings and, and maintain them as close as we can to what we have from pictures um, and sort of replicate something very similar in terms of both the brackets as well as the um, tin part of the awning structure on the front of the building. So replace, yeah, I, I, the, the strange 50s looking thing, we, we agree that's not appropriate. And we just wanted to sort of replicate the thing on the side of the building on the front and a little bit of continuity. That was the goal. I think we'll need a drawing of those bracket brackets because no, none of us remember what the brackets looked like. There's, there's, yeah, we have one picture of it, and I'll, um, I, it might actually, uh, oh, it might not be in the application. I apologize. Yeah, but um, yeah, we can provide that picture as well. Yeah, those details really, really make a difference. You know. Understood. Okay. Um, thank you, Tom. That was a good catch. Um, so, Lori, are you going to make a motion? If you want me to, I've wrote the things down that we were talking about. So Go I'll, I'll move ahead. that we approve the application as proposed with the following changes, that it be made clear that wooden windows will be used throughout, that the overhang in the front and the side awnings uh, will come back to the planning commission for final approval uh, was something that is in keeping with the mother load architecture. That the height of the railing in the back on the deck be no higher than 36 inches. And that the back window in the gable section be something closer to what was originally there and that that also come back to the planning commission. That the trespass barrier be replaced with something similar to what was there previously on facing Broad Street. You're talking about a gate? I think it was, I don't know if it was a gate. Just, I think was, it was that a gate? Uh, let me let me no, ask. it was it was a uh, basically a fixed fence. Okay, there's no access to it. You'll need it on the okay. front and the back, I guess. Um, and that we uh, appoint a liaison to um, work with the applicant on anything he needs to to be worked on, but um, any any additional details that need to be taken care of before. The final drawings are prepared for the building department and then also throughout the construction process. And that we are approving this, these revisions to the original structure because the structure no longer exists at, due, to, due to fire and that modern, modern um, building codes will be necessary to be used, uh, particularly in the back section and that the relationship to, even though the building is increasing in height, the relationship between the, uh, two, the two buildings, 416 and 414, will remain uh, not noticeably changed and that the pitch of the roof will remain the same as it was. That's it. Tom, are you gonna second that? I'll second that motion. Okay, um, Amy, call the roll, please. Uh, Commissioner Oberholzer? Yes. Commissioner Nye? Yes. And Chair Van Zant? Yes. Motion passes three to zero. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Tom to be liaison. This is your field, so. Mm -hmm. 
Would you? I'm honored. Would you I'm honored by your suggestion, and I accept. And thank you. We're expecting um, some good brackets out of this, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> the appropriate, the appro only the appropriate brackets. It's good to have a bracket expert on the planning commission. Trust me. Okay. Um, that is it, Mr. Levy. Thank you very much um, for your presentation and the fact that you're going to um, do some good work on our broad street. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to, let's see. I've got an announcement. What do we, we have, um, Amy, what do we got here? Public hearings, staff requested items, no. No, don't have anything. Future requested agenda items. Nothing new other than the bring back on this. No, I think this, we had put this on there if you guys had something that you guys wanted me to look into, so. Okay, yeah. And uh, but we do have a presentation. Uh, you have a list of staff approvals. Um, Stuart has joined us and by the way, while I'm at it, I'm going to thank Russell Wilbrand um, for joining us. I appreciate your presence, sir. Um, so I have a report. I have a report. Go. The planning, uh, the sign committee report is that we, we'll, uh, Tom is, uh, uh, Peter asked me to ask Tom to be the, uh, or Peter's basically appointed Tom to be the second committee member. So we'll be, we'll, we're working on it. We'll get back to you soon. Hopefully by uh, next, you know, the next meeting. Okay. The sign revisions on the lighting issues. Yes, yes. Thanks again, Tom. We're putting you to work. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, presentation. Who's doing the presentation? Is Dan doing this again? Let me let me bring in uh, Kathy or Dan. I, I don't know who I'm going to get here, but uh, let me. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, okay. Kathy. Hi, uh, Dan will be here in just one second. And I think Amy is going to set this up so we can share the screen. Okay. You, you want me and to share, share my screen or? No, I can, to... I can do it from mine, I think. No, she wants to screen yeah, share from her. her. Okay. You should be and, able... the, and the topic for the public is? A Brief History of the Downtown Betterment Project, being presented by the Historical Committee Commission. Okay. Good to go. Good to go. Great. Uh, Daniel Ketchum again, thank you for uh, allowing us to present. We're excited to uh, present uh, two of uh, several more to come on uh, various history aspects of Nevada City. Uh, as you mentioned today, it's gonna be in the Downtown Betterment Project. Um, and before I turn it over to Kathy, uh, I just wanted to say that she's done an awful lot of work uh, on this project in particular. And I think you're gonna like it because it's very photo intensive, much like our last one. Uh, she and I were just discussing the future ones may not be quite so uh, um, uh, photo intensive and entertaining, so to speak. But uh, we did interview, I wanna give credit to Burl Robinson, Bill Falcone, Roger Savage, and Pat Chestnut were all participants in preparation for today's presentation. So we have a, a, one of, a big thanks to the, those folks. Um, I think you're gonna like today's presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy, you ready? Okay, here she is. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you again for letting us um, give you a brief history of um, a little bit of what went on to make Nevada City what we all know and love today. I'm going to, am I set to, Share the screen, Amy. Okay. I was muted. Should be able to share. Can you see this? Not yet. <laughs> Let me know. I can see it on mine. You can't see anything? Not yet. Okay. So, um, hmm. Did you, did you do the, 
Did, did you, sh you sh click the green? Hang, hang, share screen. Okay. Oh, maybe that's what I didn't do right. I will um, try this again. Oh, I'm sorry. By the time I get realize how done. to do this, it we'll is. be done. Yeah, we'll be done with doing our our series by the time I figure this out. So, <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get that. There we go. How's that? Yeah. Now Perfect. you can see it. Well, we'll try this again. Welcome, and today's topic is um, the Downtown Betterment Project. Some of you may not have heard it called by that name, but uh, this is the project that the city undertook uh, in 1972 to um, remove the overhead power lines and install the gas lights and make the historical district more what you most of you know of today. Uh, Broad Street and the rest of the historical district didn't always look the way that you're used to seeing it. Uh, if you were here back in, you know, before 1972, you may remember uh, these scenes. And this is what we're used to today. So you can see the difference that the undergrounding made. This a number of things were happening in the mid to late 60s, early 70s, that really set the stage for Nevada City to be able to accomplish what they have. In from 1960 through 1966, for six and a half years, um, the freeway was under construction. It's not because of delays and uh, you know the contractor going bankrupt and having to get a new contractor. It took six and a half years to build the. Uh, Nevada City portion. And so just keep that in mind as that uh, what was going on there. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson created the Economic Development Administration. And then quickly following after that, um, funds began accumulating for undergrounding. And that was under a thing called Rule 20. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. As you know, in 1968, we passed Ordinance 338, creating the Historical District of Nevada City. And then in 1969, Governor Ronald Reagan created the Sierra Economic Development District, better known as SED. And that was four counties, Nevada, Placer, Sierra, and El Dorado County. In addition to that, because of the historical district ordinance, we had the, the sunset clause, the rollback on the signs coming up in that was happening in 1972. And also during the 1970s, the logging industry began to fade and that had been a big part of our economy. So the city was facing a lot of challenges. The first was that the city basically was broke by 1972. We had gone from 23 employees in the mid 60s down to 16 and a half. And that half an employee was Barbara Tui, who was our parking meter enforcement person. So they'd already cut the night shift for the police department, the county sheriff's department, which was operating out of the backside of the courthouse, as you know, at that time. Um, was patrolling town at night if we needed something. And the next step was a consideration for doing away with the police department totally. And then if that didn't work, they would be thinking about um, not doing away with Nevada City totally, but what else could they cut? They were down to bare bones. The merchants were hurting from all these years of the disruption that had been caused by construction of the freeway. And then just as the freeway was starting construction, two of the major businesses that had been in downtown Nevada City, um, which was Burt C's Western Auto and Lawrence Painters, Painters Market, which were both right down on the 200 block of Broad Street. They joined with Joe Dilley, who had the butcher store over on Zion Street, 
to build a new supermarket on a piece of land that was owned by Mr. Argel on the outskirts of town. And shortly after that, what we now know as SPD was born, became very um, successful. We all love SPD, but it hurt downtown Nevada City when those businesses left. So with that in mind, the mining industry was long gone and the logging industry was on the decline. And I put this picture in of the freeway construction. It didn't really have anything to do with the betterment project other than six and a half years of facing this. You can tell that the merchants had had a very difficult time surviving. Uh, the whole bottom section of Broad Street was torn up for that entire time. And so it, it um, had had an impact. The historical district ordinance really helped. It saved the buildings, but it wasn't enough and Nevada City needed some help. The key players during this time were Burl Robinson, the city manager, Bob Payne, who was city councilman by then, and Lon Cooper, who was a planning commissioner. They switched places in between 1968 and 72 when, you know, before Lon Cooper was on the city council and Bob Payne was a planning commissioner. Then John Rankin was the mayor at the time. Bill Falcone was a con uh, ended up being the project engineer. Ruby Nobles was kind of um, one person chamber of commerce. They were operating out of a little teeny tiny office in the upstairs of city hall. Um, Elizabeth Betty George was the contact in charge of said. Roger Savage was uh, our contact for Pacific Bell and then Barney McCary and Richard Smith were for PG&E. And I'll say that Burl as city manager, he was the money guy. He was the one who kept track of where to get money and, and what, how to, do, to make it go as far as it could go. And John Rankin had a lot of contacts, political contacts. And so he was very good at being able to secure funding. Bob Payne and Lon Cooper were the uh, ones who really approached it from the historical preservation aspect of everything. So um, those four gentlemen really were a key to making this project a success. And here they are, Burl uh, and Bill. This is Bill 25 years after the downtown betterment project. So he was just a young man at the time. John Rankin was our mayor, Bob Payne, council member, Lon Cooper, and then Roger Savage was the rep for Pacific Bell. The timing was perfect. The Economic Development um, Administration had been formed and it was formed to help distressed rural and urban communities uh, stimulate commercial growth. Funds to underground the utilities had been created and were, were accumulating since 1967 in what was called Rule 20. This was um, a result of the California Public Utilities Commission adopting the overhead conversion program to help put overhead lines underground. We had the historical district ordinance in place and the sign rollback was coming up. So an idea was conceived and it, the thought was that if they undergrounded the utilities from the National Hotel to the Methodist Church on Broad Street, that that would make an uh, enormous difference in what town looked like. It would also construct two parking lots, one at, at Nevada Street, where the old the bridge that used to connect Main Street to the plaza had been taken out. This one would have a bathroom and then one on Spring Street behind the National Hotel. And this would help with um, bringing people into town because they would have a place to park. They would install 48 gas lights. This was uh, the brainchild of Lon Cooper who um, had 
seen the idea somewhere and said, this is what we need to do. It will really help Nevada City. They needed to locate and then relocate water and sewer lines. And I say locate because they didn't always know where they were. Resurface and reprave Broad Street. And then as a change order to the original uh, project as, as it was submitted, they um, undergrounded the little tiny stub of Pine Street from uh, Utopian Stone where Pat story is at Utopian Stone to Spring Street. PG&E paid the cost of undergrounding utilities. $190,000 was available from EDA if they could show that they could provide jobs as a result of this project. This is where Betty George came in. She uh, was head of the of SED and um, she was a real go-getter when it came time to uh, finding funds. And she also was a real, um, she never slept. When she got a hold of an idea, she just went after it. And she would call Burl, um, day and night. One time Burl said she called him at 2.30 in the morning and said, get over here. The office was over where Booktown Books is now on um, South Auburn Street in Grass Valley. And um, she would call and say, come over now. I've got, we need to get this done in order to get this funding. Ultimately, um, they ended up going to Seattle, Washington, where the EDA regional office was, and it was uh, Burl, John Rankin, our mayor at the time, and Bob Payne all went up with Betty, and um, they were successful. Obtained the $190,000 in funding, signed an agreement that in the city was to put up $48,400 as a match. They weren't quite sure that they had 48, they knew they didn't have $48,400 laying around, but were very confident that by the time they needed to um, chip in their share of the money, they would have it. Ultimately, they ended up putting $54,000 in. When I said that Ruby Nobles was kind of a one person chamber of commerce, uh, Ruby, went out and she talked to all of the businesses in town and she kept going around and talking to them until she had 47 businesses that would sign a petition saying that if we got the funding, they would guarantee that they would create 148 new jobs in downtown Nevada City. Sutherland Construction Company won the bid to uh, do the work and the city contracted with Pat Ingram who had Southwestern Engineering. And um, this was for project oversight. And this is where Bill Falcone enters the picture for Nevada City for the first time. He was a young engineer, he just graduated from University of Nevada at Reno with his engineering degree. And he was a Nevada City native. So Pat thought that he would be the perfect person to um, send on this job because it was a lot of handholding and Bill knew everybody in town. Groundbreaking was August 1st, 1972. And this isn't a, quite a picture of the groundbreaking but gave an idea. Um, and it, the project ended up taking about four months. This is what merchants in downtown Nevada City faced during the downtown betterment project. And this is what Nevada City looked like during that time. You can see the power poles, you can see the signs um, and you take special notes. See how they're all hanging out over the street and the sidewalk. That was one of the things that the sign rollback and that the historical district ordinance tried to do was to take, to get those signs from hanging out over the streets and sidewalks so that you basically saw just down Broad Street. When I said they needed to locate, then relocate the water and sewer lines, 
that was one of the challenges. One of the first shovels full of dirt or um, backhoes full of dirt, as Bill said, that they did up by the Methodist Church, they hit, or by the Nevada Theater, I guess it was, they hit um, a water line. When they had asked, are there any water lines here? And had been told, no, no water lines anywhere around there. The guy dug one scoop of the backhoe and uh, set off a geyser, an old pipe that had had a, a tap drilled it, pounded into it to fix a hole. And um, that was what they faced a lot of times during this project. They kept hitting water lines that they had no idea they were there. So it was a, it was a learning experience. This is um, when they're just finally finishing up putting the um, paving on Broad Street and they, Here's um, PG&E taking down the overhead poles and the difference between having those poles there and those poles gone was just night and day. And this is just a picture I, I thought you'd enjoy. Bill Falcone running down the center of Broad Street the day they did the paving. Bill always, you know, uh, late for a meeting and on the go and running full speed. Nothing has changed. And the final paving of Broad Street before any cars were allowed on it, they finished in late November and they, they had debated whether they should lay the paving down and Pat Ingram decided to go ahead with it. And they got it done just in time because uh, it snowed right after they had done it. So it was perfect timing. Otherwise, Broad Street would have been dug up the whole through the entire winter. Now things that were not in the original project, but you may think of as a part of the downtown betterment, and we all think of it as that, was the removal of the signs. This happened um, at the same time. They tried to do it as a, a combination, but it was actually a part of the historical district ordinance sign rollback. And it just happened to come due. It, they had to be down by 72. The restoration of Otsassi office in the South Yuba Canal building was actually a separate project and that was done in 1978. Commercial Street, Main Street, Coyote Street, the undergrounding on those was not a part of the original project, but they were done as funds became available. And ultimately we have four undergrounding districts in total and in the, um, downtown area. The next one that had been planned was to take out down the rest of the poles that are visible on Broad Street as you look down at the plaza, but the funding um, through no fault of Nevada City through PG&E has not been available. And then retaining the post office and the Bank of America downtown, which people think of as part of the downtown betterment project, um, but it was separate very important thing to do um, to keep those downtown. This is a, kind of gives you an example of why the sign rollback was so important. Um, this was typical looking um, both sides of the 200 block of, of Broad Street. And um, you can see the sign clutter, what we saw every day. Um, it's my dad's barber shop right there with the barber pole. So um, it's probably the least intrusive of the signs that were down there, but there were a lot. Eddie's sign at the bank club. Uh, once this sign came down and the, and the neon sign, I don't know if you can see right here where my cursor is, where it says Eddie's that lit up and blinked at night. Once Eddie took those down, the rest of the signs, um, the owners of the buildings took them down and there were no more struggles over it. And as a result, here's our beautiful Nevada city that we know and love today. The results from the, this original downtown betterment project um, and what it kicked off was they not only met, but they exceeded the goal of hiring 148 people downtown. And they achieved more than that they, they had ever dreamed possible at the time. 
uh, they thought it might make a little difference. That, and I think everybody has just been overwhelmed by what a difference it made. Uh, as Burl said, Nevada City started believing in itself again. And there was a big turnaround. It wasn't overnight, but it's been a steady turnaround. People started fixing up not only their storefronts, but their houses, the property values began to, to increase. And it, it started to heal the divide that there was between business owners. There had been a divide for quite a while between those that wanted the freeway, those that didn't want the freeway, those that called it the hysterical district, hysterical ordinance, and those that called it, wanted the historical part of it. Undergrounding versus no undergrounding, if you can believe it, some of the merchants did not want to put the utilities underground. Unfortunately, parking meters versus no parking meters, I think that divide might still be here today. So over from that original project over the next 10 years, um, more than $10 million in grant funds were received to do projects in the downtown area. So from that quarter of a million dollars at the time of the undergrounding, first undergrounding project in 1972, between then and 1982, $10 million spent. And this is, uh, I think, the best example you can see of how it worked. This is before the undergrounding. And I tried, these are pictures, I tried to find pictures of the, the basically the same picture the, with all the power lines, with the, the lines down, the gas lights in. And then as you can tell probably from, I'm all over the place, sorry about that. Um, this was taken uh, just about a week ago. I wanted to leave you with a few quotes from uh, people. Um, Bob Wyckoff had a couple of ways of, of describing um, what Broad Street looked like before the Downtown Betterment Project. One was he said it looked like the seamy underside of the Las Vegas Strip. And um, another quote of his was the unsightly overhead wires and gaudy tenderloin style signs were all um, evident anyway. Uh, and it, that really describes what Nevada City looked like before the, the wires were taken down and the signs. Burl's uh, comment was that the Betterment Project was Nevada City believing in itself. And I, I think that is just spot on. It's uh, Nevada City taking a risk and believing in itself. Bill's comment is typical Bill. Um, he said, people kept talking about re-envisioning. I didn't even have a vision. I had no idea what they were talking about. I had just graduated from UNR and I was young and had no idea what I was doing in the field. So I relied on Burl and since he had an I relied on Burl since he had an engineering background. And um, then Roger Savage had, uh, he said when he went to the city to get the undergrounding records, Jeffrey said he has their records of what they have underground, right? So they sent him out to the corporation yard, which was on Zion Street at the time. And he said he walked in and, and he was new to town in the project. And, and he said they were all sitting around having lunch. And Jordan, George Nelson took off that metal hard hat that he always wore. Those of you who know George know what he's talking about. And he kind of reached over and hit Charlie Adams on the head with it and pointing at Charlie, he said, the underground records, they're all stored in there. And that is how Nevada City was operating at the time. So part of the undergrounding project was also starting to get actual real records of where the water and sewer lines were. So, this was another example of Nevada City doing it the Nevada City way. That was having faith in their citizens and taking risks, stretching, stretching the limited dollars that they had to get the maximum impact. 
And ultimately that was a quarter of a million dollars plus in addition to that, what PG&E paid for the undergrounding. Keeping the businesses and the citizens in the loop. The city, meaning borough, the Chamber of Commerce, which was Ruby Nobles, uh, PG&E and Pacific Bell, each individually all went around to all of the different businesses, con constantly told them what was going on, uh, what they could expect, what the next steps were, how long it was still gonna be torn up. There was a lot of handholding that had to go on, but they did try to keep everybody in the loop. And then they did it with preservation in mind. And that they required the contractors and there was some pushback, but they said, no, you have to do it this way. When they were gonna be doing the sidewalks, if there was historic markings, for instance, the um, Odd Fellows in the, in the sidewalk up at Copps Bakery, when they did uh, Pine Street down by the Masonic Lodge, if there was any markings in the sidewalk, they had to saw cut around them. When they were doing the, uh, they had to preserve the granite curbs. If they were doing the undergrounding, taking the wires down and, and then putting them into the sidewalk, they had to make sure that they really took care of the architectural details on the buildings and that nothing was destroyed and they retain the true character of Nevada City. Their vision was achieved, was a job well done. And I think we can all agree that um, what they started out with in that vision in 1972 has come true and then some. And there's our thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, that concludes our presentation. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Kathy for a job very well done. And we're looking forward to uh, next month's presentation as well. Do you have any questions for us? No questions from Peter, but I thank you very much. And um, I, I think this would be a presentation that would be uh, welcomed by the council, by the way, that's can reach a larger audience. Very fascinating be glad to do so amy is this, are, these, are these up on the website yet i think you're going to have a place on the website where people can click on it and see are the, is that system up yet yeah I, I created the web page but i i have to actually convert them into pdfs because it won't take powerpoint which i just realized today as i was trying to get the last one up so i will work on that and um, they will be on the website fabulous thank you so much dan you're welcome. Thank you yeah, for the opportunity. You. It's really great having these uh, be able to be taped and available for anybody in the future, too. So, Yahoo. Questions? Any questions of our uh, historical folks? Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Um, we have the presentation. Correspondence, I, Amy, do we have any correspondence of importance? I do not have anything. Okay. Announcements, I've got an, kind of an announcement. There's uh, some question going around about changing the, uh, the hours of the planning commission. And I, I think that's, I think we've all been contacted or most probably contacted. And so that's, that's ongoing. But other than that, no announcements from me. Anybody else? Just that our next meeting is April 15th. And thank you. And we will conclude. This is the end of the Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I keep, yeah. <laughs> All right, motion to adjourn. Second it, somebody. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Mm -hmm.